Dark matter, dark energy, and gravitational waves, it's been a banner year for science in general, and cosmology in particular. Here to help the rest of us understand what it all means, we welcome back Lawrence Krauss, director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University and foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and it's good to have you in that chair again. It's great to be back here with you again. Okay, in February, we were told that for, quote, for the first time the universe has spoken to us through gravitational waves, up until now, we have been deaf. That's the quote. <laughs> nice what quote. were we deaf to before this? We were deaf to, to something that's happening in this room all the time, to ripples in space. Every time I wave my arms, which I do a lot, mm. I'm actually, according to Einstein from 1916, who, who told us that matter curves space. If matter moves around, it produces a disturbance in space that propagates out this, at the speed of light. And, and there are gravitational waves, as they're called, going through this room all the time, which means the distance across this side of the room is getting smaller and larger all the time, and this time smaller and larger. We don't notice it, at least if we're sober. <laughs> but uh, that's because gravity is so weak, and the, and the oscillations are so very small, you would never have thought you could actually ever detect them. And what's amazing is an experiment was built called LIGO, uh, which is in, uh, has two big devices in Washington State and in Louisiana involving two big arms that are each four kilometers long. They're at right angles to each other. And, and when a gravitational wave comes by from a distant galaxy, and we'll talk about the waves that were produced, mm -hmm. what they have to be able to measure, and it's amazing they can do this. So one, one arm gets a little shorter, the other one gets a little longer, and they have to me measure a difference in length of a four kilometer arms, two of them, if they change by an amount equal to one one thousandth the size of a proton in a four o'clock. I mean, you would never, science fiction writers would never imagine you could do that. You can't and do that with the naked eye, I guess. You can't, in fact, I would have never thought it was possible. Mm -hmm. But after 40 years of trying, they finally were able to get to that level. And, and that means, you know, if a truck hits a pothole 20 miles away, it creates a bigger signal. So that's why they have two detectors, one in mm. Louisiana and one in Washington, so that it, they have to see the same thing. If a gravitational wave comes by, it takes about 10 milliseconds to go from one end of the United States to the other, so they look for the same signal. And, it's, and even the quantum mechanical vibrations of the mirrors that they're doing, because in order to measure length, they send laser beams across either end and see how long it takes for the light wave to come back. Even the quantum mechanical vibrations in the mirrors are bigger than that. So it's amazing they could do that. But on, within an hour after turning on the apparatus, after it had been built and, and, and refined, they saw this beautiful signal, which in fact you could actually almost hear, because it's a vibration of two black holes orbiting each other and finally colliding 1.3 billion light years away from us. That means that this, the event happened 1.3 billion years ago and we lucky enough now and they, they lucky enough they turned on their detector just in time huh. and if you think about what they saw you see in order because gravitational waves are so weak you have to look at cataclysmic events and these were two objects each 30 times the mass of the sun colliding and and this is the other thing that i find amazing they collided in about a, at about two tenths of a second or so in the final burst of radiation one was 36 times the mass of the sun the other was 29 times the mass of the sun. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but I was going to ask if 36, 36 plus 29. 29, 65. You got it. Okay. Isn't it? It's amazing. You know, an American TV host wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> but, 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 uh, uh, and so you think they form a black hole of mass 65 times the mass of the sun. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was 62 times the mass of the sun. Your math is not wrong. In that tenth of a second, it emitted three times the mass of the sun in gravitational waves which is so weird to think about that. That means you turn the mass of the, three times the mass of the sun into energy. Our sun is burning about 10 billion hydrogen bombs every second. And over its 10 billion year lifetime, it'll converse, may, convert maybe 1% of the mass of the sun to energy. Hmm. Over 10 billion years, in one tenth of a second or so, this converted three times the mass of the sun to energy. It pr produced more energy in gravitational waves than all the stars in the visible universe do in that one tenth of a second in light. It's a, it's, that is mind blowing. It's mind blowing. It's amazing. And what is neat about this is that it has opened a new window on the universe. As that quote you mentioned said, it, we were deaf. We were also blind. We now have a new window, gravitational waves that allow us to probe the physics of black holes and in distant regions of the universe. Well, that's and maybe, what I want to find more about. Okay. Now, now that we can hear and yeah. now that we can see, what does that help us do that we couldn't do before? Well, we can look at places we could never see before. We can look at 
the most cataclysmic events which caused space itself to curve up like a roiling sea to understand the physics of black holes but also the physics of galaxies because there's a big black hole in, in the center of every galaxy, in the center of our galaxy, there's a million solar mass black hole. In most galaxies, there are very large black holes. And it's kind of a chicken and egg question we don't know the answer to. Did the black holes form first and then the galaxies around them or the mm -hmm. other way around? And so we'll learn ab about that, but we'll also ultimately, as we improve our gravitational wave detectors, be able to look for other exotic events. And the more cataclysmic the event, the greater the gravitational wave signal. And the most cataclysmic event of all was the Big Bang. And we may eventually be able to detect gravitational waves from essentially almost the birth of our universe. The beginning of time in some respects. Exactly, which means we'll be able to have an empirical handle on the beginning of our universe and turn metaphysics into physics. So, do you think that'll happen in your lifetime? I'm not sure. I think in order to be able to do that, we'll, we'll probably, it'll pro in this century, I expect we may be able to. Huh. And if all goes well, I might still be around. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the neatest part of all of this is every time you open a new window on the universe, we're surprised. So every day I'm surprised if I'm not surprised, in a sense. And so we know some of the things we might see, but what's really neat are the things we didn't expect. When, we open, when Galileo looked out with the first telescope, he discovered the moons of Jupiter. Every time we've discovered, we've had a new window, we've discovered something unexpected. We now have a vast new window on the universe, and what I expect will happen over the next 40 years as this becomes the, the astronomy of the 21st century is we're going to be surprised a lot. This is a bit of an odd request because I don't think I've ever requested this of another guest before, but we are talking about something that is on your shoes. <laughs> can you put your shoes up on the table I'm so that we can... I'm very happy to put my shoes. I, it's my normal position now, as I'm is, working. It, it, I usually I, I'm sleeping. There but... is some space, the final frontier, on it, these shoes. Yeah, yeah, there is. Is it any particular galaxy or part of our galaxy? I'd or... like to say it was, but it's just, it's just, a, it's just <laughs> an image of some stars and some globular clusters and stuff. It's, those it's... shoes are so you, Lawrence. They really are. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm really, I rarely get to do that, so Steve, so I'm very happy I got to show off my sartorial uh, splendor. Indeed. Let's go through some terms here, because mm. um, I think in order to explore some of these yeah. items, we need to know a few things. Sure. Dark matter. What's dark matter? Uh, it's matter that doesn't shine. <laughs> you know, and physicists much... have a very great linguistic perspicacity. Yeah. It's, it is actually, it's, it's the stuff, it's the dominant matter of creation, if you wish. Most of the mass of our galaxy and of all galaxies we see, at least 90% of the mass in the universe doesn't shine. We don't know what it is made of. We think it's some new type of elementary particle. Which mm. means, so our galaxy, 90% of the mass of our galaxy is not stars and gas and planets. It's this stuff, and if it's really what we think it is, it's a gas of elementary particles, then those dark matter particles are going right through you and me as we speak here. Mm. Which means, to detect them, we don't have to use telescopes. We actually build big devices underground to look for that stuff. And so we're looking for this kind of dark matter because we think it's a, not only a new type of elementary particle, which will reveal new things about the fundamental structure of matter. If the dark matter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Because what, we talked about black holes before, but we do know that these vast conglomerations of dark matter collapsed early on in the history of the universe, forming potential wells into which all the normal matter fell. So galaxies wouldn't have formed. We, there wouldn't have been enough time since the Big Bang for galaxies to have formed. And if there weren't galaxies, there wouldn't be stars. If there weren't stars, there wouldn't be planets. If there wasn't planets, there wouldn't be TVO. <laughs> you know Catherine Fries? Yes. Yeah. She was on this program not too long ago. She said we're going to get to the bottom of dark matter probably in a decade. You think she's right about that? It's one of those things we've been saying for a lot of decades. Uh, OK. <laughs> I'm, you know, I try not to make predictions about anything less than two trillion years in the future. For two reasons. One, it's a lot easier, and two, no one will be around to check. <laughs> we can't call you on that one, can no, we? No, no. No. Well, All right. could, but, uh, but the program would have to be long running to do it. <laughs> uh, second one, weak force. What's weak force? Well, the, the electroweak force, the weak force, there are four forces in nature. The strong, the, well, the ones we know, gravity and electromagnetism, the two we come, that really govern most of the things in our daily lives. But in fact, there's another force called the strong force, which holds together the particles called quarks inside nuclei. Mm -hmm. The weak force is a weak force, as you might imagine, and it, and it only operates over the size of an atomic nucleus, and you might think, well, it's kind of irrelevant, but it's responsible for the nuclear reactions that power the sun, which are pretty important mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. because uh, they allow life to happen. And that weak force turns out to have been uh, be due. It, it turns out we've discovered, actually, and this is one of the most remarkable 
journeys human ever humans have ever taken. In fact, my new book, which will be out next year, is, is really about this, is the fact that the weak force and the electromagnetic force, which appear very different in your, the scales of you and me, are actually, at an underlying sense, different manifestations of exactly the same force. And they, they are hmm. different because of this invisible field throughout nature called the Higgs field. Called the which? The Higgs field. And of course, it turns out associated with that field is a particle which we predicted to exist called the yes, Higgs particle. Higgs. And as you know, of course, there was a great hoopla because of the Large Hadron Collider. A few years ago, on July 4th, 2012, we discovered the Higgs particle, which tells us, it's amazing, it tells us that we're here by accident. Particles have mass, the particles that make you and I up, only because there's this background invisible field with which they're interacting. At a fundamental level, we think they actually have no mass, but it's like swimming in molasses. If you're swimming in molasses, you feel a lot heavier. As these particles move through this Higgs field, they get resistance and they act heavy. And if that field wasn't there, once again, you and I wouldn't be here. And that's why it's important to know that. Exactly. It's important it's... to know it because, you know, look, the great thing about cosmology, first of all, is it takes us away from politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it allows us to sort of realize how our petty myopic rivalries and issues are just short term. But more importantly, it really addresses the fundamental questions that everyone asks about themselves. How do we get here? Where are we going? And, and so it won't make a better toaster. It won't make a faster car. But like art, music, and literature, it, it addresses those, it gives us a new perspective of our place in the cosmos, and it makes living worth living. Has some intrinsic beauty to it. Yeah. You know, the problem with science, it seems to me, is it also has practical benefits. <laughs> and so, therefore, whenever there's a discovery like this or the work I do, people say, what, what practical significance is it? But you don't ask what's the practical significance of a Mozart symphony. No. And so, it's, uh, in fact, I'm very proud of the fact that all my research has no practical significance whatsoever. <laughs> All right, well, having said that, mm -hmm. some years ago, you asked about how research is going to resolve the question about whether there is one universe or many universes. Are you any closer to figuring out the answer to that question? You know what's really neat? A few years ago, and in my last book, I wrote a lot about it, it was kind of a metaphysical speculation. Mm -hmm. But what's really neat, to come back to what we talked about earlier, is that if we are able to detect gravitational waves from the earliest moments of the Big Bang due to something called inflation, actually, it will give us very strong indirect evidence about the possible existence of other universes. Hmm. Because it turns out this inflationary theory predicts that other universes should be out there, not ones we can't detect directly. But as a consequence, there's also gravitational waves. If we were to measure the gravitational waves, we could probe the theory. And if we could probe the theory enough, we'd be able to confirm that, in fact, the laws of physics behave in such a way that those other universes must exist. So we'd be kind of like the physicists or chemists in 1905 when Einstein showed indirectly that atoms must exist, but no one ever thought you'd see atoms. Now we actually can. But everyone knew they existed because everything else required them to exist. We may get to the point where we can turn metaphysics into physics. If we can detect gravitational waves from the Big Bang, we'll be able to, in some sense, indirectly probe for the existence of other universes, if they exist, and show that our universe isn't unique, which I find, again, something else I thought that in my lifetime would never be resolved as an empirical question. Hmm. So as your thinking at all evolved on the issue of whether we are the only beings in the galaxy capable of understanding the conversation we're having right now? <laughs> um, I don't know if we're understanding our conversation. <laughs> but uh, look, the, the galaxy has 100 billion stars. And what we have learned is that most stars have planets around them. And there are many more exotic solar systems than we thought about. There are 100 billion galaxies. It seems highly unlikely to me that we are the only... Well, certainly, I expect there's life. There's certainly microbial life, maybe mm. elsewhere in our galaxy, in our solar system. I, mm. I expect maybe under the oceans of Europa we might find microbial life. Is there intelligent life? That's a much harder question. It's probably much rarer. It took us four and, almost four and a half billion years to, to, to be here on Earth. But there are so many planets and so many stars, I would be surprised if there weren't intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. Mm. Unfortunately... It's a big universe, and it's highly unlikely that we'll ever know about it. And that's, you know, that's a shame, but it's worth trying. And there's a, efforts, SETI and other programs, to look. But it's a long shot. Hmm. But I, 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 I'd be amazed. On the other hand, you know, a lot of people, I'm, I'm going to be talking at an event later this week where people talk about fine-tuning. They think it shows some significance. You know, they think the universe is fine-tuned for life. Well, it is. it has properties, so we can be alive here. But in fact... Most of the universe is very inhospitable for life. And in fact, most of the universe is trying to kill us every day. If you think about it, the fact that we've been around when there could be supernova explosions going off nearby or gamma ray bursts or all sorts of things that could happen, 
it's really amazing that we, we, we're here and, and because we're in a remote corner of the galaxy. So most of the universe is not fine-tuned for life at all. It's pretty hostile. So it may require a very special environment like that on Earth. Hmm. But again, there are enough stars, enough planets that I suspect, even though it'll be very rare, the great thing about our universe is it's, is it's so big and it's so old that rare events happen all the time. Did we just get lucky to be in this particular piece of real estate here and therefore We're, we're certainly lucky, but you know, it's, it's, it's not, you can think of it as being lucky and you can say, well, you know, the odds are very small, but if there are enough, if there are enough planets in enough different environments, it, we're, what would be amazing was, would be for us to find out we were living in a place that we couldn't live, hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. It's like, it, you know, in, with evolution, people somehow think that, the, you know, that's evidence for design, but it's not. If the bees couldn't see the flowers and see the colors of the flowers and be attracted, they wouldn't reproduce. It's kind of a cosmic natural selection. It's like saying, going back to my shoes again, <laughs> isn't it amazing that my body is exactly long enough to reach the ground? <laughs> well, is, you always tell good jokes when you come here, so I'm going to ask you to tell oh, another one. Oh, you, okay. quote, you have quoted your friend, the Nobel laureate, Frank Vilcek. Well, yes. That he says what we really need is a theory of something. Yeah, yeah, instead of a theory. There's a joke about that, right? Yeah, well, he What's said, you know, there was a lot of talking about a theory of everything in the 1980s and 90s string theory. Mm. There was a lot of hoopla that it was a theory of everything. And, um, and what Frank said, rightly, is I don't want a theory of everything. I want a theory of something. <laughs> I want a theory that actually makes a prediction that you can test. Mm -hmm. Now, that wasn't to necessarily put down string theory, but we've made grand claims. And, and, what, and physics doesn't, isn't based on what's elegant or beautiful or what we like. It's based on what works. And so it's really important to realize that we shouldn't get too detached from experiment. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes metaphysics. And so what's really been nice is we have made a lot of progress in theories of something. And in fact, you know what? The theory of everything really wouldn't be a very theory very much. I mean, it would be very important because a theory of gravity and quantum mechanics, so-called quantum gravity, was really kind of necessary to understand the beginning of time. So from mm -hmm. a perspective of fundamental understanding, it's incredibly important. But it may only be important for understanding the beginning of time. For understanding how oatmeal boils, you wouldn't need a quantum theory of gravity. <laughs> All right, moving along. I think we've only got a few minutes left okay. here, which is a shame because uh, there are more jokes that I want to hear, but we're going to okay, do the best well, we can I'll here. Try and Some of the more fundamental questions of life you have said that, quote, resolution may be around the corner, but only if we are extremely lucky, or it may take centuries, if at all, depending on the kindness of nature. The kindness of nature. I want to know what that means. Well, you know, nature was kind enough to have a uh, have a two black holes collide just in time for this machine to turn on mm -hmm. with just the right sensitivity. We we're in a situation where where we've we've hit all the low hanging fruit. I mean, it, the experimental physics was a lot easier a, a century ago. It's hard to to, to to probe the fundamental structure of nature, mm -hmm. and sometimes. Nature is not very kind. For example, I've created beautiful theories. They're just beautiful. It turns out nature hasn't been wise enough to adopt them. <laughs> and, and so often if you're a theorist, it is kind of amazing and almost terrifying when you think of something and you're writing something in a paper up in the middle of the night to think that nature might actually obey it and give you evidence of that. I'll give you an example with dark energy, the energy of empty space, mm -hmm. which is really the dominant energy in the universe. And, and we've talked about it before. Maybe we'll talk about it again. It's... It, it means that empty space weighs something, and we, we don't understand why. But when I first proposed that that might be the case, I didn't dream for the, in the slightest that it was really true. I, it was a kind of a heretical argument that I thought would demonstrate what was wrong with some observations. And the biggest shock to me was when it turned out to be true. It's, hmm. it, it, it's, har it's hard to believe that, Nate, that we, we mere humans can sort of grasp every now and then nature. and. Um, uh, and, we, and nature has been kind, but sometimes we have to probe it a little bit. And many times um, it, it's a long, hard haul. And, and in fact, the, the people who are doing gravitational wave experiments have been doing them for 40 years. Hmm. It's not as if they just started last week. It, it requires a kind of dedication and, 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 and perseverance and ingenuity that is amazing. And to me, the discovery of gravitational waves is really a testament to the perseverance and ingenuity that humans have. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's what I find it so exciting. Cool. Let's finish up on this, uh, related to education. Should cosmology be taught in high school, every high school? Well, you know, yes. Be, I mean, in the sense that we should, we should, what we should teach, I've often said we should teach questions, not answers. Mm -hmm. The answer, we live in a, in a world with lots of answers. You can Google the answers. And in fact, kids should learn how to be able to 
search the internet for answers, but the more important thing is to be able to tell sense from nonsense. Mm -hmm. and, to, and the other thing that's important is to think of good questions. So fun, I think that schools should address the idea of questioning, and in fact, teachers shouldn't always know the answers. They should work with students together to define them. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that the kind of questions cosmology addresses, which are how did we get here, where are we going, are we alone in the universe, are the kind of questions that turn on young people, of course, because the kind of question, if, you know, I often tell teachers that the biggest mistake you make, and I could tell TV hosts this too, the biggest mistake you make is assuming your students are interested in what you have to say. <laughs> what you have to do is you have to seduce them. You have to go to where they're interested in and find a reason for them to be interested in, in, in thinking about this. So use cosmology as a hook, use Star Trek as a hook, use, use anything, use politics, whatever you can to try and convince students that critical reasoning, questioning, and and a willingness and an understanding of how to separate the wheat from the chaff is what's really going to be important in the 21st century. All right, so you asked three good questions just now. Let's assume that everybody's taken cosmology in high school mm -hmm. and they're going to graduate knowing three basic facts about cosmology. What are the three most important facts yeah. that people who graduate high school need to know to have a better understanding? Well, well first of all, that the Big Bang really happened. It's not some it's not some controversial thing. The universe is 13.8 billion years old, regardless of what the Republican candidates in my country th think, okay? <laughs> it's 13 half billion years old. That tells us something about the universe. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. The fact that the universe is expanding, and the amazing thing is that expansion seems to be speeding up instead of slowing down, which is just, uh, would have been unfathomable over a century ago. And, and I think the last thing is that we, we are completely cosmically insignificant. Hmm. That if you took us and everything we see in the universe, all the stars and galaxies and got rid of it, the universe would be essentially the same. The universe is, a, we're, we're a little bit of pollution in a cosmic sea of dark matter and dark energy. 70% of the universe resides in dark energy, almost 30% in this exotic dark matter, and we are a little 1% residue that happens to be left over. So, so much for a universe made for us. Professor Krauss, 13.8 billion years for the universe, 4.5 billion years for Earth, and the universe is expanding. Thus endeth the lesson. That's a good spot to end it on. Thanks. Great to see you again. Thanks so much for this. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.